It's an Archeo Death interview with Professor Howard Williams and his guest. Welcome everybody to our 15th Archeo Death interview. Can you imagine that we've got as far as 15 of them? And I'm very pleased to introduce my special guest for our conversation today, Dr. Abigail Gorkovich Downer, who is a newly doctored a brand new PhD student to the University of Chester, just passed her, her examination, a Viva Voce examination, and therefore fresh, fresh out of the doctoral tin or whatever. I don't know what metaphor you want to use, but hello, Abby. How are you? I'm I'm doing fantastic. You know, um, I'm here, you know, just coming from Canada all the way here um, due to COVID circumstances. But yeah, I'm, yes. uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. You had a, um, a a digital viva, didn't you? You had to because you you were back in Canada and uh, and and uh, yeah, an examination via the, the the Teams link. So an extra well done for uh, well, congratulations for the the passing your PhD and also um, you know well done for coping with the 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 digital viva voce. Well, you know, so it's uh, been exciting but unusual times for um, all this whole process. But you've 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 prevailed, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, you know I wanted to use this uh, interview to go through something about you and your um, background, and then hopefully discuss your doctoral research and what you're going to be doing. Um, alongside it and afterwards and moving forward if that's okay so I mean I wonder if you could give people a bit of an introduction to um, your, you, yourself. Yeah absolutely so yeah my name is Abigail Gorkiewicz Downer and I just recently graduated as, as Professor Williams has said uh, from the University of Chester with a PhD. Um, I specialize in early medieval mortuary archaeology so uh, burial practices from particularly France, Germany and England. And uh, a lot of my research has actually, um, you know, transacted not only those areas, but uh, I, my background, my early beginnings really uh, started in Canada. So. So you've, uh, you, you did your undergraduate uh, de and master's degree both in Canada. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. So at the earliest time, you know, when I first started with, um, with my archaeology career and anthropology career, for that matter, it was at Lakehead University, um, in the um, in Thunder Bay, northwestern Ontario, and also in the Aurelia campus in the earliest days in 2007. And uh, a lot of it was involved with, you know, um, you know, indigenous archaeology and pre-contact is what uh, the term that we use usually use for, um, you know pre-Columbian um, sites and stuff. So a lot of that, you know, in 2009, I, I was um, a field assistant at the Nolalu, uh, in Nolalu, Ontario, which is kind of even further closer to um, the United States border. It's like in between Thunder Bay and, and uh, Minnesota, I guess. And uh, there I was doing some excavation on a site called the Martin Bird site. And that was kind of my first instances where I really came to to be in in you know in archaeology and trying to you know just it it just furthered my interest in all of that and you know the techniques test pits excavations stage two and three of archaeological investigations and just learning about you know um, just the different cultures that came before us you know and just being really really uh, entranced by um, connecting with the human past so. fantastic so you 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 got that field and academic background um, i do and, and and then then but before you did the the thinking about doctoral research you you went on to, you did you already started getting into early medieval burial archaeology didn't you at that master's level if, I, if i'm right yeah you're right yeah i um for my master's research i at Trent University in Peterborough, I focused on um, critiquing sex, sex assessment um, in uh, burials from Worthy Park in Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it was something that I, I thought was a very um, intriguing practice because I, I noticed that people were grouping, uh, recreating these binaries of male and female without actually considering, you know, what... Yeah 
the cultural artifacts may actually suggest otherwise yeah. if there were other genders um, being represented in the population. That's a fascinating topic, and I've just examined a whole doctoral thesis on this by uh, someone else uh, at another university, which obviously is not public yet. But uh, you know, uh, but it's, it's a it's a topic that is uh, it is a really exciting area of ongoing discussion about these 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 problematic, you know, lazy, you know, binary, you know, uh, suppositions that are made um, both in the academic and the popular presentation it sort of bleeds from the academic you know literature through so that's a fantastic topic and uh, so so but why why go on and do a PhD how did it happen what happened then well so the interesting thing about it was I've, I've always maintained this fascination with um, the early medieval period um, and in Europe in particular Western Europe as well and a lot of it came from my early days at Trent University there was a individual in can't remember exactly the name. Um, I think it was Professor Herman, but he was actually someone who specialized in Bavarian, early medieval Bavarian uh, cemeteries, burial sites. And so he, his, um, one of his students, I believe, um, who was also like some sort of, well, the artifact um, uh, inventory specialist at Trent University. She she dealt with all the inventory and in all of our collections, archaeological collections. And she was, uh, her study, her thesis was on uh, Altenerding in Bavaria. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I, when I was looking through all that, I just became very fascinated with the inhumation burial practices. And also um, with the suggestion of uh, Professor Connolly, um, at Trent University in, in Peterborough. He, uh, not Nottingham Trent, um, but uh, he was uh, suggesting that, you know, you know, maybe I should look into the Anglo-Saxon burials and yes. on all this. So um, looking at how, you know, the, because there's a rich material culture um, repertoire in inhumation burials from Anglo-Saxon England. And it was something that I could use to critique the practice of, you know, uh, retaining that sex binarism in in yeah early medieval mortuary archaeology and uh yeah so it was something that i continued to like fester in my mind all the while between 2015 and 2016 i was also a uh, field technician um so i was archaeological field technician doing um commercial archaeology here in canada so it was it was always a, a a part not just of my academic career but it was something that you know commercially I, I maintained, um, and I mean even though that was more of an Ontario focus you know pre contact and historic archaeology, um, I, I made the decision to look at oh you know there was this this practice of um, assigning the term amulet to certain objects, and it just it, it struck me as really odd. At first, I was I was for the practice, and I wanted to understand amulets yeah. at the beginning, um, and to understand their deposition. But then I soon soon came to realize how arbitrary the category was. It didn't really reflect context, and it didn't really it wasn't necessarily used in in a way that it could be interpretive. Uh, um, it wasn't really a good interpretation. I didn't find it to be good enough at all. Um, so yeah, at that at that time, um, I really started looking into doctoral programs, and you know, the University of Chester came to my, uh, you know, came into my uh, line of sight, and I, I decided to set on uh, applying. So I mean, uh, then I mean, it all transpired that we we co-supervised. Uh, Dr. Amy Gray Jones and myself were co-supervised. You are. We're both mortuary archaeologists, and obviously Amy has a more bioarchaeology angle to her work. But and I've got the early medieval so uh, interest. So uh, together, that 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 was our, that was the supervisory team, and uh, you know, um, and that problem of amulet amulets became, developed, didn't it? And and you you, you know, so uh, and that what became the, the the challenge to to re re think of all these objects. And you know, I I, I still find it. You know, I find it exciting, but realizing that, you know, yes, I, I obviously I knew about amulets and I'd read about them and I'd actually discussed them a bit in my own work. But again and again, 
tenaciously that term comes back, doesn't it? And, you know, it's just, it's applied to all of the, we have the weapons in some graves and we have brooches and dress accessories in many graves, some with weapons, you know, and so on. Others, you know, other female gendered assemblages that don't have weapons, you know, but but these other items that are so often missed, aren't they? Because there's so many varieties of them and they, they cross that binary gender division that people, um, you know, focus on. And I find that's why this is such a deliberately disruptive topic in a good way. You know, it's, it's yeah. you know, disrupting those comfy categories. And uh, that's what I thought was so exciting from the very start. Your your research was was challenging that. So can you give us a sense of how it all developed then? Yeah. So uh, a lot of it really began with reassessing, as you said, that that uh, that comfy term, you know, amulet and how it's been used as a, um, a catch-all for very unique and, and rare artifacts overall um, in, in early medieval uh, inhumation burials, but also in cremation burials as well. But my focus was mainly on inhumation burials. But what surprised me even more was that even though this practice was so dominant, it did receive little criticism. So um, there had been one study in Germany that I found, well, in German, um, that did, you know, question its, uh, the term's ability to, um, you know, be applied to objects and how we could use it uh, as a valid interpretation. That was Herdick 2001. Yeah. But very few have actually questioned it. And, and it's just been very, like a typological category just repeated over and over again. Um, so, I kind of, I was looking at different ways of seeing how we can actually get to the, the meat of what these objects were for, you know, how, what was their meaning, their intention and all this kind of stuff. And one of the things that I found intriguing was a spatial approach, yes. you know, there, yeah, there were different approaches that, um, I mean, they had been used before in amulet research, amulet research to, uh, advocate for, um, for defining objects as amulets, like uh, Mini 1981, which is a primary example, um, which was a typology in Anglo-Saxon burials of, of creating, um, you know, a framework for people to identify amulets and critique them and all that kind of stuff. But um, there was one statement that really shocked me was that, you know, inferring nearby objects as amulets, if they were found to be uh, next to more demonstrably am, am, uh, amuletic objects like amber beads. And that was right. on page 28. And so I felt like, you know what, that doesn't really necessarily, you know, I don't think that really reflects how these objects could necessarily be all amuletic, or we can use that to, you know, um, divide divide these, these objects into that category. But, um, yeah, so I was more I was more interested in the spatial approach, and um, a lot of it came from previous work on um, looking at objects in graves and understanding uh, the spatial positioning of objects. So you know, this is Heinrich Hecke in 1992, his thesis on um, weapon burials and different weapon uh, objects that um, they reflected different uh, patterns in Anglo-Saxon burials. Um, but also with pattern 1982, even back into the 1980s, um, with, uh, understanding the different, um, positioning of artifacts and how they have might, uh, have meanings, um, or portray to them. And that might be, uh, why that could be it. So I wanted to apply that to all of the objects. So, um, understanding how these were, um, you know, how we could actually infer meaning of these objects. And uh, I decided to actually focus on clustered objects in particular. And a lot of that was more to the point where a lot of these amuletic objects were considered uh, clustered together. They were never really um, isolated in many oh, of the groups. Right. So that was something that I wanted to um, focus on and it, it, it really brought some interesting conclusions, but um, before I go to that, yeah. um, there were, I also focused specifically on females were another focus. 
And that's also due to the fact that many of these objects are found with females. Yeah. And that's how, you know, I think a lot of people use the term amulet is not completely, but a lot of the time with uh, female individuals. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, finally, yeah, Amber was also something that I wanted to um, investigate in this regard because it was possibly one of the more uniform um, inclusions that are in, like interpreted as, uh, as amuletic in graves. So these are, you know, even though they don't necessarily occur at great numbers, they are found um, and they are uh, more, po more common, I'd say, than other forms of amuletic objects. <laughs> so do you think that um, your skills in, I should have said that your language skills help to dictate your ability to look at this topic on both sides of the English Channel, right? You, were, yeah. you, were, you, you had uh, French, a bit of German and English and that mono monolinguistic approach to a lot of the archaeological record of the early Middle Ages, you could break that down. But why did you pick on the case study regions that you did in, you know, in to take this forward? Because you could have looked at lots of different parts of northwestern Europe where we have furnished burials of early medieval date. Why, why did you look where you did? Yeah, so the reasons I've chosen these, uh, these specific regions was mainly because there was, um, well, for the Kentish ones, I, uh, even though this wasn't necessarily the focus, um, the Kentish burials were, um, were investigated because they, a lot of the time they've been, um, they've been compared and the, the material culture from the graves has also often been shown to be, uh, have a lot of continental European origins. Yeah. Um, so sometimes the, um, I'm sorry about this right here. Let me get there. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'll just go in and uh, go to Alsatian burials first, actually. <laughs> um, so Alsatian, uh, Alsatian contexts were actually very useful because in Alsace, um, I noticed that there wasn't a lot of these cross comparative analyses that um, were using Alsatian material culture. So even though it is quite far from the channel, I found that it was actually more, um, it was a very rich source and a lot of recent publications have come out um, that, uh, and more recent date as well, that haven't just been addressed by, by these um, Anglo-Saxon and for lack of a better word, um, Frankish and Alemannic uh, cross comparative studies. So yeah. that was one of the main reasons I chose Alsace in particular. Um, and it, you know, so it was kind of bringing that into an English sphere, um, Anglo, uh, Anglo studies as well, Anglo Saxon studies. Um, but Kent has often been compared. So that was another region that I specifically chose because it was, um, it's often been compared with uh, continental remains and material culture. But uh, East Anglia was another choice that I decided to, to use because it was also shown to have some continental affinity in, in material culture, but it wasn't necessarily um, compared quite as frequently as Kent with the continent. So um, it, it was kind of uh, like another comparison that we could use to understand um, these objects and their meanings, essentially. Fantastic. So you've got three different comparison regions and you were looking particularly at the seventh century and female gendered assemblages. Is that is that fair to say? Late six. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Late six and, and uh, early seventh and general seventh century burials as well. And this is where a lot of these artifacts are found, um, not exclusively, of course, but, um, you know, this includes uh, so-called crystal balls, um, items like you know, um, cowrie shells are also yes. quite prominent in the seventh century and late sixth century burials. So it's these kind of objects that keep on reappearing. So I thought I would have ample evidence to understand these objects within, you know, their their clustered formations. But, so what did you find out? Do you think in your for your doctoral research? Yeah. So what was interesting is that through my research, you know, the the 
the switch was more towards understanding. Um, there were some primary findings that I found between the two tests of my my spatial approach. So, you know, understanding object clusters and versus amber beads, right? So my approach, the uh, compact contained assemblage analysis or CCA analysis, really found that um, contained objects, object containment was actually a very common practice in mm. inhumation burial. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, it really showed that it was frequent and it, it wasn't necessarily um, an isolated thing. But another, another, um, another conclusion that I found was that the CCA positioning, the object cl clusters themselves, um, their positions reflected regional tastes. So there was like, there was a, um, each grave construction region. So in Alsace, for instance, this is a primary example for um, late sixth century Alsatian female CCAs, 35% of the CCAs or the object clusters were placed to the right of the body uh, in contrast to 2.6% of the um, roughly comparative range uh, um, of broadly seventh century um, overlapping with late sixth century Kentish female CCAs. So 35% compared with 2.6% was was quite drastic. And I, I realized that the right of body was also um, was also pretty prominent in um, the type of construction preferred for Alsatian graves, which was more based on a Morkin, uh, which is proper, popularly called Morkin style chamber, which involves that division of a, a left and a right um, partition, right? Yes. And so this this is this is something that was very unique in contrast to um, Kentish and East Anglian burials, which happened to be a little bit more narrow. So what was really what was really a, another shocking conclusion that came uh, from this study was that uh, there were often similar object types that were placed in the similar uh, spatial positions of CCA. So CCAs that happen to be position the same um, spatial region or spatial uh, zone happened to actually have similar object types. And that that was something that really reconfirmed the idea that there was a, um, these weren't random practices. These, was, these there was, there was an underlying um, uniform, well, not necessarily uniform, but um, practice of, of certain regions being preferred uh, for certain objects. But also into that showed how complex um, these components were. So a lot of these CCAs that were in, you know, contemporaneous um, burials and, and in similar, similar position CCAs um, were actually distinct in form and decoration. So the object types could be very, uh, very unique in these. Um, but another, another cons well, perhaps not um, firmly, I'd say, perhaps not like a uniform practice, but something that was quite striking in, in several burials was the um, evidence of predepositional damage of objects. So like knives and box fittings. Um, it seems that some of them were actually destroyed uh, intentionally before they were buried. So that sounds strange. Yeah, yeah. So it, it didn't seem like um, seem like some of the the tips were were broken off in some of the knives, and I don't think necessarily my study really delves into it in detail because it was focusing more on the um, object clustering. Yes, but it is something that is worth um, investigating in the future because I think we should understand how you know this might reflect um, overall um, cosmology potentially. Yeah and in early medieval beliefs. Um, so another uh, another group of findings that it came to uh, with amber beads was that um, as suspected, amber beads were usually, amber in general was universally rare in all, this, in all the samples, but it really occurred at different regional frequencies. So Alsace seemed to be also the least, um, had the least number of, of graves, female graves with amber, oh, right. but um, East Anglia seemed to have the most. And the interesting thing about that was, and these were universally below 20% uh, 
So, and they didn't occur in high frequencies necessarily in, in their respective clusters. Right. But um, it, did, it, it did bring me to this idea that perhaps there was this um, differential access to amber resources, you know, that may reflect North Sea trade routes um, in the seventh century and late sixth century. Um, but yeah, what also really reconfirmed the whole CCA analysis too was um, that these clusters of, of amber beads were actually highly individualized. Mm. Yeah. So that was something that wasn't necessarily um, brought to attention in previous studies yeah. um, because they usually focused on communal and regional identities. Whereas, you know, what the CCA approach also really shows is that um, a lot of these object clusters or CCAs are unique and individualized in their composition, you know, not only in their form and decoration of similar object types, but also within the different objects that are grouped with them. And wow. yeah, so I think that was something that was really worth uh, emphasizing as well. Um, but one thing that didn't really uh, like confirm with or, or agree with my uh, CCA conclusion was um, that the spatial positioning of amber object clubs, clusters didn't actually reflect any regional differences. And I think a lot of this came to the fact that because they were very like generally rarer in, yeah. in the grave. So a patterning wasn't really um, observable. So yeah, that, that was the primary findings of my, my research. And that's uh, really, that's really fascinating, Abby, because of course, I mean, I've supervised this with Amy and heard it in different incarnations as it's gone along and you know, hearing you distill down some of the key findings, these you know, careful choices people are going in that may be related to the dead person themselves or persons and or the, the mourners. I mean, did you come to a conclusion about whether you think the term and amber, uh, the term amulet is ever applicable because it gives that sense of objects that have a magical or perceived to have a magical quality. Did did you find that there's no salvaging that term? Is it is it completely off limits now for, for archaeologists because it's so misleading? Or do you think there's potentials for still talking about these objects as amulets? Yeah, I think I think it is actually a very misleading term. And what I found in my study was that it doesn't really reflect the, you know, that diversity that we're seeing because of the clustering of different objects with one another. And it doesn't take into consideration other objects, um, which I write about too in my, uh, my recent publication. It doesn't take into consideration other objects that could have had um, these amuletic functions um, because then they're completely ignored. So yeah. overall, it is something that we should probably avoid as archaeologists. Um, right. what I found, I think even though certainly they would have existed or similar type of objects, I don't think we're in a, a position to actually use it, um, and basically disseminate that information to the public because it's just really difficult to, um, tie a, such a loaded term to, you know, very, very unique and um, inclusions in, uh, of objects. And, and objects that would gain their meaning, not necessarily in themselves, but through association with those compact close assemblages. I mean, I mean, do you feel there's going to be an uphill struggle about trying to convince people who really want, you know, a lot of these objects to be amulets, to be magical, to, 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 to see either pre-Christian or proto-Christian or early Christian communities across early medieval Europe as wrapped in superstitions and, you know, mobilizing these objects to protect against the dangers of childbirth or starvation and famine and, you know, just a, a bad back, or, you know, whatever, we don't know, do we? You know, but, but, you know, do we, is that, is that part of a bigger dark ages stereotype of seeing everyone as a bit superstitious? <laughs> I, I think in general it is. I mean, I know there ha have been recent publications, especially in terms of Norse archaeology and and Viking Age archaeology, as well as uh, Scandinavian Iron Age, um, that really talk to notably Price Neil Price. Yeah, um, yeah, and talk about you know the the magical, uh, I guess properties of certain objects, and you know I think there's a lot of you know, historical evidence to support the idea that, you know, perhaps groups of people did believe in these things, you Cash. know, 
Yeah. Um, there's no question about it. And I don't believe my, my research has really denounced um, the existence of, of such, you know, beliefs and, and, and practices, but it has been more of a, it's really demonstrated that, you know, the way that these objects were used, at least from what we understand in graves could not be uh, tied necessarily with amuletic purposes. Um, and when we continue to use that, I think it can be misleading. I think it can um, take away from other potential interpretations, you know, of what these objects were really for. And, um, and that, that was a case in point with Amber, you know, being something that was, you know, joined with other object types, um, whether it was, you know, glass beads or, you know, knives or um, different other purposes. And they could have had um, significant significance for individuals, uh, their trade relationships um, with different communities that could have been as far as the Baltic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which, which is a region where amber in particular has been um, belie is believed at least in this period in time to have um, been a major source of amber, um, the Baltic Sea region. So you were seeing the objects, the choice to put an object in a grave may say something about that identity of the person or their family or their kin group in life, but potentially also was, you know, tied to afterlife belief beliefs or did you sort of, you weren't so convinced by that? Yeah, well, there was an interesting little facet of my research too, was, was the fact that object clusters wasn't really restricted to what you would say um, are amuletic objects. You know, this was actually a practice that included objects that aren't regularly referred to as amulets. And the fact that there was quite a few, um, like it was just a dominant practice overall um, was, it really, it really brought into this idea that, you know, perhaps wrapping and and putting things in boxes and containers was was something that was um, was an important part of inhumation ritual. Yes, I and agree, yes. Yeah, it, it really brought me into um, some of the histories, uh, uh, Gregory of Tours, uh, History of the Franks, and the idea that, you know, objects were contained also in traveling um, and, and used in journeying and things like this for, for living persons, of course, but it also brought me into the idea that, you know, there are some ethnographic examples um, where there's a belief that the, the dead actually journey to another place. Yeah. And so to what extent could that be a relationship of, of uh, people containing objects for storage in the afterlife or perhaps for using them in the afterlife? Um, Another, another interesting uh, facet of that was the use in Hong Kong in recent years. I, 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 br I bridged this with the depositional dam pre depositional damage, that's what I called it. But basically, you know, breaking items before they're put into burial really, really brought me to this, this idea of, um, it reminded me something I've always been very interested in, um, but uh, a practice of burning uh, objects and destroying objects in order to transport them to, um, to the afterlife. And this was something that uh, is noted in ethnographic examples in China and in Hong Kong specifically as well. Um, and a lot of that is, is to, is that the idea of destructing, it well, was of destroying in, in order for it to be usable. And this really can, Contract, like it really uh, contradicted some of the other um, implications that there was this idea of killing objects, you know, that have been um, proposed, say, for from Andrew Welton 2016. Uh, oh, yes. And spears and stuff like that, because there was this idea of destroying the function and yeah. the, the use, usability of an object through, um, through destruction. But um, yeah, so this kind of flew in the face of that. What if what if the afterlife was actually, you know, it was like a, a very twisted or maybe um, alternate form of the the this reality, and so maybe that's how people conceived how these things could have been transported and used in the afterlife. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that was those were really really uh, 
interesting conclusions to that thought, you know, made me think about how I could, uh, what kind of avenues I could take in the future. I mean, it's like uh, whether it's the afterlife is the inversion, like sort of the the TV show Stranger Things has the upside down. This, you know, ups, or or it's the, the the funerary process. You have to invert things to sort of distract the ghost or the to ensure they the the spirit of the dead. There's so many different ways. So little we know about what people in the early Middle Ages thought, and you see people being so definitive about well, when they were Christian, they would have thought this, but the pagans would have thought this. No, we really expect a messy situation for most of the early Middle Ages, and no one's telling us in the written sources, so the archaeology is the only clue. So this is why I think it's such a wonderful, rich set of data that you examined that shows us both those broader trends and the the personal choices as well, and uh, that's the best of archaeology, I think, Abby, is when it, it shows us the big patterns, the regional comparisons, uh, you know, of what people are doing with the dead and, mm. and, and then also showing those personal choices. And I think that's one of the strengths of your thesis, many strengths of your thesis, it was, was you balanced that up. You didn't just make it all about what early medieval people did on, on a grand canvas, but also looked at those individual graves and worked through the individual's spatial relationships between objects. So that, that was really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was a very interesting journey too to uh, incorporate some more less known, I guess, in the in English research and Anglo-Saxon research um, burials from, you know, Alsace. And, um, you know, with my abilities to to use French and speak French and, and having my my connections uh, with Archaeology Alsace um, based in um, Celusta uh, in, in um, southern Alsace it was very well actually on the border of, of northern and southern Alsace it was uh it was a very good um inclusion I think because um there are some burial sites that um I have yet to really uh include in this analysis and um but have been recently published too um and I know of mainly from uh Bahran, which is up in the northern region so Erstein is one a good example. Uh, a lot of the material cultures held at the uh, archaeological museum um, in Strasbourg, and uh, yeah, th it's just there's there's still a lot more to include on that um, on the early medieval practices in in Alsace, but also joining into um, you know other objects and uh, the destruction um, post uh, I mean <laughs> pre burial destruction of objects. I I, I really enjoy that. Obviously, you were busy for, uh, uh, you know, this colossal project, you know, doing a doctoral research. But it, as well as that, you were busy, um, you know, getting involved in conferences, you know, as well as data gathering, you're traveling and you also present you know, as well as presenting research, publishing your research. So but maybe could we have a little bit of a broader sense of the kind of things that doctoral researchers get up to beyond, you know, just getting the thesis done? <laughs> what, what would you say in that regard? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, a lot of it, too, was um, I, I had the ability to uh, publish. I, I went about and published a part of my literature review um, in 2019. So it's my first official publication, and it's a chapter in a uh, British archaeological report uh, called Current Approaches. Oh. People, places, and things in the early medieval period. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So this this was um, edited by Heather Christie and Megan Casson, and I'm in chapter three, which is what are, I don't know if you can read that. Yes, that's fantastic. Yeah. What are ambulance yeah, yeah. for the early medieval dead? Um, rethinking cowries in seventh century Anglo-Saxon and Alemannic graves. Yeah, yeah. So this is this was something that you know I I wanted to um, reassert and it was you know just bring up some theoretical issues with with how we use the term amulet in archaeological practice, and it was an avenue that you know I could definitely stick my foot in, and uh, really you know. No, not many people had really been addressing this this problem, so that was something that was an easy way to actually you know get and publish. It was based on a oral presentation that I gave in Glasgow at the early medieval uh, association uh, early medieval student symposium um, archaeological student symposium and uh, in 2018 called uh, assemblages formerly known as amulets. 
And so, yeah, so it was it was something that, you know, through my other my presentations in total, I've 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 done five oral presentations. Um, so a lot of it has been also with theoretical archaeology group, um, even uh, at Deva or, or Dewa at Chester. University yes, we did. We organized it in 2018, didn't we? Was it 2018? Yeah. Seems like a million years ago now. But yeah, you were you were there when presenting away with the rest of us. Yes, it was a great, great event for Chester to have the first theoretical archaeology group come to Chester. In. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was it was the 40th, I believe. It was 40th conference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I've also been quite, um, quite active in the uh, European Association of Archaeologists. That's right. So the EAA, um, my first presentation actually there was a poster in 2016, and it dealt with um, my master's research on queering. It was called Queering Sex, Skeletal Sex Assessment at Worthy Park. That was hard to say. Uh, nice. Hampshire in England. Yeah. Oh, that came from your master's work, of course. Yeah. And in the very early days of, or was it even just before you started your PhD with us? I it, was. it was. It yeah, was. That's yeah. it. Yeah. It was in the summer of 2016, so um, it, it really just uh, I was in I was in Vilnius at that point in time, which uh, which was a very good experience for me also. Um, but also trying to get you know, I guess start my my academic uh, my academic career, you know, becoming more known among yeah. among archaeologists and even having the opportunity to uh, present my findings. Um, to it to the actual session that I was a part of, even though it was a poster presentation, it was something that people were very intrigued by, um, which understandably too, it's something that, you know, uh, the critique that we're using was, was very essential. Um, but yeah, so a lot of it, you know, even EMAS in Glasgow and Scotland, and then even, um, in 2019 and 2020, I did some, uh, presentations at the EAA. Um, in Bern and Budapest. And uh, well, it was a virtual conference in Budapest, of course. And um, during my PhD, I was also uh, involved in organizing some conference sessions, uh, co-organizing. Um, so with Rachel Cartwright in 2021 for the just the past um, virtual conference in the EAA, we did medieval glocalization. And yeah, yeah. And uh, also um, the virtual conference in Budapest with education shaping per public perceptions of medieval archaeology with uh, uh, Professor Carenza Lewis at the University of Lincoln. Yeah, so that was that was uh, another involvement that I had um, in trying to get sessions that, you know, spoke to these 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 topics. And, um, you know, the, the coolest thing about it, too, was that a lot of it dealt with um, aspects of my research, the, um, you know, how we, how we form our knowledge and our practices of education and, and, and how that relates to um, how we interpret and how the public, the public engagement of, of uh, early medieval material culture. And uh, also what was really cool was the globalization aspect, which was something I hadn't even fully considered before. Um, yes being primarily, I'd say, uh, a Roman period investigation or, or something that's more dominantly um, used in other areas of our archaeology. So trying to see if I could use that to apply it to early medieval contexts and, you know, and my relationship to understanding certain objects like cowries. A lot of these objects are exotic, right? Um, yeah. 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 So you've, you've got this kind of you know, I think it's really useful for for people to get a sense that you're 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 doing your research, you're promoting your research, you're networking, you're taking it beyond your PhD uh, 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 in terms of presentations that are part of your PhD, but, but some of it, you know, is, is you know maybe looking to the future. I mean, and that leads me to ask, you know, what do you think is coming next for you? What what's where are, what are you up to, and what what might what, where does it go? <laughs> so uh, some of the interesting things that I'd like to do. Um, Actually, I'd like to continue this research too um, with comparing Alsatian remains, um, the CCA using a CCA approach, and applying it to uh, burials from uh, contemporaneous um, Baden-Württemberg, which has often been, yes. you know, compared uh, previously. 
being um, almost being a, a uh, in in the seventh century and and sixth century being a very culturally connected region of Alsace, and uh, very so using that would have been something that I uh, that I'm I'm planning to do um, for a postdoc. Um, there are some other investigations that I I am seeking to look more into are boxed assemblages in Anglo-Saxon graves, because I don't think that's something that has been really approached on a um, like a more broader um, investigation. And that's something that I think deserves uh, deserves like its own separate yeah. um, investigation. And um, I mean, the only closest, the closest thing that I could even imagine that somebody had ever done it was Vera Evason uh, for yes. Buckland Dover and in Kent. And, but realizing that some of the boxes that were actually buried had broken elements to them and may have been broken before they were buried was, was something I was like, you know what, are we going to, you know, can we just like, instead of just calling them boxes, let's see how different these boxes are. What are their, you know, contents? What are the woods that are they made of, you know, their construction and, you know, trying to figure out how, how varied are they? Are, do they vary on an individual basis or are they very uniform, you know? Um, so yeah, that, that is another research, um, another uh, avenue of research that I do wish to take in the future. Um, and also, I think another another element of research that warrants investigation is is um, a CCA approach to understanding objects uh, in Viking period uh, yes. material culture. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it it's something that still is quite frequent. You know, the way that we use amulet, and I think you know the CCA approach has shown that perhaps we can take a different avenue and see what the data tells us. You yes. Know? Yeah, rather than dumping uh -huh. the category on it, look at the patterns coming from the the furnished burials of the Viking world too. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, and I mean, I know, I know this this approach hasn't necessarily been developed for uh, cremation period, like cremation burials, but I do think there may be ways to understand cremation burials. Um, I I was inspired by a recent talk uh, during our session in 2021 with um, the. Uh, what was it it was the horde study on uh the galloway horde yeah the galloway horde that's it that's it i, w I was i was inspired that, by that because the um the presenter actually went through um the layers yes. of of the material culture and i wonder to what extent we can understand a spatial positioning if we can understand spatial positioning in cremation graves absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. I wonder if that would have any impact in how we understand not only the process of of these objects, but whether they they had potential meaning associated with, you know, their different, you know, layering and um, basically composition. Well, you're creating the ultimate compact as closed assemblage of a potted, if it or bagged, the cremation, uh, cremated material with objects, a careful selection process. Yeah, no, I think this is not just about inhumations, but I think, you know, what, what you're saying is that there's many different applications of this approach that get beyond lumping categorizations onto material, but actually working with that diversity from the broader patterns to the localized choices. And I think that's where uh, more studies need to go. And, uh, and I th certainly see the, the, the value of doing that for both Anglo-Saxon and Frankish material, but also Viking, yeah, and yeah. beyond maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, also cowrie shells have been, um, it was brought to my attention too, um, in the Eastern Baltic states, they had been present um, in uh, what are called late Iron Age graves. So that overlap with the 6th six, century AD. Um, but what really shocked me was also the fact that cowrie shells in 7th century and late 6th century um, Alsatian and Kentish graves, they, they predominantly associate, they're associated with um, adult females a lot of the time or adolescent females, whereas cowrie shells in the Baltic, uh, in Estonia and these areas are actually associated with children. So there's also a different way of understanding what could these mean, you know? So not even in the early medieval period or what we could say the broader early medieval period, 
interpretations by localized people even didn't also overlap like they they also had different interpretations of these objects so we can't yeah. necessarily it, it also goes against that that amulet argument you know we can't just say oh you know a cowrie shell is an amulet in this context and it's an amulet in this context it may have something that signifies you know a, a age identity or you know perhaps even beyond that if there are rare inclusions because they they are certainly rare in in um, the material culture I've studied so far, um, it could be tied to, you know, access to very unique and exotic materials, um, which certainly may have um, implications, you know, for um, understanding society and uh, how people express themselves as world travelers, perhaps, you know, <laughs> these, these are things that like, uh, you know, I even I even wonder, especially with um, some of the poetry from the early medieval period, Beowulf, and you know, uh, talking about you know gold and and you know other rare objects, crystals and stuff. The stories that are tied behind these don't necessarily all link to magic, and um, that's yeah. that's something that I I think really warrants further investigation in in different contexts. Well, Abigail, I think it's really exciting to chat with you. And so soon after your doctoral Viva Voce examination that, uh, you know, I know it's a, a, a bewildering time once you've had the result, but you've still got some minor corrections to sort out. But that should be, you know, but it's 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 a, it must feel a bit of a uncertain time. But, uh, you know, you're do, you've done so well and I, I look forward to you know, how you develop things in, in coming months and years and get these corrections out of the way. Um, do you have any final thoughts for anyone who might be thinking of doing doctoral research, any pitfalls or, you know, potential things that you would like to pass on with sage wisdom, having just completed your <laughs> becoming doctor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I would probably say um, one of the things that um, is probably the most useful pieces of advice is when times get tough and you feel under pressure and you feel like you can't do it, um, there, you have to commit and understand that, you know what, if you commit to it and you, and you push through, you'll get through it. And it's wow. common to all doctoral students or people who are doing, uh, PhDs, it's something that you need to, um, persevere through. Now, I have to ask, you had the hat on earlier, Abby, and now it's back. It's manifesting itself again on your head. <laughs> uh, can you, you, you've got, a, I have to say to for, for viewers, uh, Abby has a, a, a real constellation of headgear. And uh, I, I'd like to, uh, you know, what, what's going on with this one, though? <laughs> I, I have to say, so this this one, it was uh, courtesy, was a um, uh, a personal uh, well, it was a reconstruction um, commissioned by um, that I commissioned by uh, for myself, of course. But it was uh, from Kazar Bazar, who are based in Hungary, and they do um, reconstructions of silk, you know, silk objects. So this is real silk, as you can see, but it is a um, reconstruction of a 10th century or around that period A.D. Uh, of Byzantine, Byzantine style, uh, Greek um, silk uh, patterns. And um, so this, this style of cap was something, you know, it's part of also my broader interests in um, early medieval Europe, but on the eastern end in the Carpathian Basin and uh, into the surrounding regions of um, different various nomadic uh, Eurasian groups. Um, so this is based on some of the earlier caps worn by, you know, Khazars and also by um, Magyar or Magyarok, which are the Hungarian conquerors and various peoples like that. So that's that's one of the many examples that I have. Some of them are a little pointier, of course, but um, yeah. And I didn't, wasn't able to show this earlier, but I wanted to also bring it up. This is my birch bark hat <sighs> that I've made personally. That's a replica of sort of prehistoric uh, bog finds, isn't it, or something? From we've got those from the Bronze Age, haven't we? Yeah, Bronze Age, exactly. Yeah, so there are Bronze Age examples in southern Germany, 
Um, ah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And so I wanted to recreate a conical hat like that we found in um, in in some of the iron well Iron Age and Iron Age burials and Bronze Age burials uh, from from Central Europe. So there there is actually a thesis that I was inspired, but it was about um, birch bark hats in particular, and because there were several examples or at least parts parts of them from France, Switzerland, and Germany. So um, yeah, I made it with Canadian birch bark. So I sewed it together and. You've yeah. many talents, many talents, and and uh, <laughs> that is the, we could do a whole separate video on all your paraphernalia that you've got because I've <laughs> we, every 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 doctoral supervisory meeting there'd be a another hat or another um, um, oh, amulet or oh no a compact uh, <laughs> close no no you know what I mean another <laughs> object. <laughs> compact um, contained assemblage yeah yeah compact contained assemblage yes exactly you are you are a veritable feast of compact contained assemblages um no i, I was going to say um we before we finish off i i want to say well you know uh, chester we miss you and we miss your hats and other <laughs> you know <laughs> but uh, i will put a link in the description description below about links to your main publications and your academia edu site so people can go and find out more about your research and read it and uh you know just get a bit of context to this uh conversation but to finish off i just want to say thank you so much it's been a great great fun to talk to you and we'll have to talk again soon but for yeah. the purposes of this chat it's cheerio for now abby <laughs> cheerio for now for relaxing times make it archaeodeath time